Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, my country, France, has been heavily involved in the fight against HIV AIDS since the very beginning of the epidemics, remains and will remain committed as you will hear it now. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I have the honor and the great pleasure of announcing the President of the French Republic, Mr. François Hollande. That's fine. Mesdames, Messieurs, chers amis, arrêter l'épidémie du sida dans le monde, c'est possible. D'abord en faisant travailler ensemble les milieux de santé, les organisations internationales, les associations de lutte contre le sida et les organisations non gouvernementales. Ensuite, en accroissant encore nos efforts pour mettre au point un vaccin, et développer toujours davantage la prévention. Également en facilitant l'accès au dépistage pour réduire l'incidence de l'infection dans tous les pays, quel que soit le mode de diffusion. En permettant un accès universel au traitement pour diminuer les risques de transmission. Enfin, en concentrant nos efforts pour protéger les populations les plus vulnérables, c'est la solidarité entre les nations qui est ainsi en jeu ce qui suppose l'implication des pays les plus riches envers les plus démunis. C'est grâce à cet engagement que je veux ici renouveler au nom de la France que nous parviendrons à parcourir la seconde moitié du chemin, la plus difficile, traiter non seulement 7 millions de personnes, mais 15 millions de malades du sida. La France, depuis la création du Fonds mondial de lutte contre le sida, la tuberculose et le spaludisme, et celle d'United prend une large part à cette œuvre commune. Elle est le deuxième contributeur financier du Fonds mondial et elle entend poursuivre sa participation, mais aussi la diversifier. Nous voulons créer des financements innovants, supplémentaires. C'est le sens de la taxe sur les transactions financières que mon pays a décidé de mettre en place dès le 1er août. Au sommet de G20 et de Rio, j'ai proposé d'élargir cette taxe à l'échelle de l'Europe et du monde de façon à ce que nous puissions verser des sommes nouvelles à la lutte contre le sida. Dans un contexte, je le sais, difficile sur le plan économique, sur le plan financier, l'engagement des États et des donateurs est indispensable. Mais c'est avec la jeunesse que nous gagnerons la bataille. C'est elle qui est la première victime de la maladie. C'est donc avec elle que nous devons cultiver l'espoir de la faire reculer. Voilà, chers amis, ce que j'étais venu vous dire. Il dépend désormais de nous d'arrêter l'épidémie du sida. Si nous le décidons, nous le pouvons. Now we are happy to introduce the award presentation of the IAS NIDA Fellowship. Dr. Ellie Katabira and Dr. Jacques Normand. Good morning and welcome to for day one for our plenaries. Drug use is a global issue that brings with it greatly increased risk of HIV infection. A total of about 120 countries have reported the cases of HIV among people who injected drugs. Overall, growth in the numbers of new HIV infections has slowed down in most of the regions of the world. One exception of this trend, however, is the continued growth in numbers of HIV infections linked to injecting drug use, especially in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where HIV link uh, prevalence among people who inject drugs is higher than 40% in some countries. Harm reduction services still need to be scaled up to reach everyone at risk. Use of other substances such as alcohol, cocaine, and methamphetamine is also associated with increased HIV risk behaviors. 
considering the high prevalence of HIV in people using drugs and other substances, there is an urgent need to study the impact of, HIV, of these substances on the progression of HIV and co-infections, as well as the interactions with the antiretroviral drugs. Good morning. My name is Jacques Norman. I'm the director of the AIDS Research Program at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. This initiative was started about four years ago, and we intend to continue pursuing it. The intent of it is to try to bring young investigators and established investigators to dedicate more attention to the intersection of drug abuse and HIV AIDS. The stipend consists basically of $75,000 for postdoctorate for 18 months, and the same amount of stipend for more senior individual for eight months. There is no restriction in terms of whether or not the fellow has to uh, identify a mentor in the United States or anywhere else. They could find mentors in any institution across the world, and uh, it's uh, open to all international applicants, both senior and junior investigators. Now we would like to introduce the recipients of this fellowship. We'll start with Makabotso Bokromov from Tajikistan for the project Temporary Labor, Migration, Substance Abuse, and HIV Risk among Tajik male migrants in Moscow under the guidance of the mentor Judith Levy. Salakio Islam from Bangladesh, the project Mechanisms and Implications of Injection and Information among HIV-CCP for Infected Drug Users in the Allied Study under the guidance of Mentor Kurikor Kukana. Georgios Nikolopoulou from Greece for the project developing measures to study how macro-level economics and social changes may have affected the HIV risk in the population of injected drug users under the guidance of the mentor Samuel Friedman. <clears throat> Mark David Paida from the Islamic Republic of Iran for the project Neuroprotective Effects of Estrogens, uh, Soy, and Influenza Against the Development of HIV Induced Neurodegeneration in the Awake, Freely Moving Rats Through Modulations in the Dopamine Transmission System. He's under the guidance of a mentor, Rosemary Guz. Unfortunately, he was, he's not with us because he was denied an entry visa to the U.S. The last one is Said Lumin Radufa from the Islamic Republic of Iran for project prevalence of ATS use among those who are under MMT, BMT, and its effect on HIV risk related behaviors in Ifshan, Iran. And he's under the guidance of mentor Richard Lawson. In closing, I'd like to take the occasion to remind everyone that the program will be opening sometime in early December, and typically the closing date for applications are late January, early February. So these, all the information will be posted on the IAS webpage. I'd like to also thank Sharon and Ulrich from IAS that have made this year the most successful uh, year for the applications. We've received a large number and we were very, very satisfied with the quality of applicants. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Introducing Kevin Moody, CEO of the Global Network for People Living with HIV and Red Ribbon Working Group member. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's my pleasure today to introduce the Red Ribbon Award, the world's leading award for outstanding community-based organizations active in the AIDS response. The award recognizes and inspires 
exceptional responses to AIDS at the community level. Community involvement is key in the AIDS response, and these organizations are the ones who are closest to the people. We need to listen to them and follow their leadership. In recognition of the importance of the Red Ribbon Award, the organizers of the International AIDS Conference have graciously given the Red Ribbon Award a special session during the conference to highlight the Red Ribbon Award winners for 2012. This will be on Wednesday, the 25th of July, from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock. The speakers for this session will be Michelle C. Debay, Crown Princess Medemaret of Norway, Ong Ong Su Ki, Jim McDonald, U.S. Congressman, and Marisol Touven, French Minister of Health. Also important is that you should know about the community dialogue space in the Global Village. Delegates are warmly welcomed to visit their community dialogue space, meet the Red Ribbon Award winners, to learn about their experiences, and to attend the community dialogue space sessions. Now, this is a distinct pleasure for me to be able to introduce the Red Ribbon Award winners for 2012. I'm going to ask them to stand one by one and ask you to please hold your applause until the end. In the category of prevention among by people who use drugs, Afri Sat Association Iran, and Espo and Espoleo, Mexico. In the category, Stopping New HIV Infections in Children and Keeping Mothers Alive, Women's Health, Giramatsko Post Test Club, Uganda, Global Youth Coalition Against AIDS, Egypt, in the category of Advocacy and Human Rights, Initiative Group Patients in Control, Russian Federation. Please stand, thank you. And the Delhi Network of Positive People in India. In the, treat in the category of Treatment, Care and Support, we have the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association in Kenya. And we have the Positive Women's Network in Sri Lanka. And last but not least, in the category of prevention of sexual transmission, we have the help in Myanmar, and we have Fondation Servovie from Haiti. I'd ask them all to stand up, please. Stand up. Round of applause. To introduce our first plenary speaker, please welcome Professor Françoise Barré-Sinoussi, Director of the Regulation of Retroviral Infections Unit at the Pasteur Institute in Paris and Nobel Prize Laureate for Medicine. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dear colleagues and delegates, it's a real uh, privilege and honor to introduce the first speaker of the very first plenary session 
of the 8th 2012 conference back in Washington, D.C. after 25 years. <laughs> Only one person could give this very first talk, a person with a real vision of science and what science can do for public health. It's a re reason why I'm really delighted to introduce this person, Tony Fauci. <laughs> Tony is the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease at the NIH since 1984. He has overseen an extensive research portfolio devoted to preventing, diagnosing, and treating infectious and immune-mediated disease. Dr. Fauci is also the chief of the NIEID Laboratory of Immune Regulation, where he has made numerous important discoveries related to HIV AIDS and is one of the most cited scientists in the field. He is the author, co-author, or editor of more than 1,200 scientific publications, including several major textbooks. And he has received numerous awards for his scientific accomplishments, including the National Medal of Science, the Murray Woodward Lasker Award for Public Service, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to call Tony. Thank you very much, Francoise, for that kind introduction. Madam Chairperson, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to kick off the scientific component of this international symposium and to take the theme that was developed last night with great enthusiasm and to discuss with you over my time allotment why we now have the scientific basis to be able to even consider the feasibility and the reality of an HIV AIDS free generation. I want to start first by a little background. I love maps. I love the deep blue of the oceans, the refreshing green of the plains, and the awesome mountains. But when we now look at maps, many of us in this room over the past couple of decades, they have taken on a different complexion. The dreaded differential shadings indicating prevalence in different regions of the world with now 34 million people living with HIV AIDS. If you look in the upper left hand corner of the slide, you see the United States where we have 1.1 million people living with HIV. And focus in a little bit and you see Washington DC. Now there are a couple of issues about Washington. We all welcome you here but it was 25 years ago that the International AIDS Conference was in Washington. I've had the privilege and the opportunity to participate in every one of the 19 conferences of the International AIDS Society. But I want to play a little bit moment with you, with Washington, when you talk about what we share globally. Like I said, I like maps. This is a Google map of Washington, D.C. This is where you are sitting. Again, the dreaded shadings. Because in Washington, D.C., we have a prevalence that in many respects equals some of the PEPFAR nations. As Michelle said last night, it is the best of times and the worst of times. The worst of times is the prevalence. The hope for the best of times is, as you heard from the mayor last night, Washington, D.C. has implemented an aggressive and innovative program 
to have a major impact which can serve as an example, and I'll get back to that in a moment. But let's get to the gist of what I want to develop with you over the next several minutes. We want to get to the end of AIDS. That will only occur with some fundamental foundations. And these foundations are the basic and the clinical research which will give us the tools which will ultimately lead to interventions and then ultimately these will need to be implemented together with studies about how best to implement them. So let me briefly go through each of these with you. The basic and the clinical research. We have had a stunning amount of advances in the arena of basic and clinical science, which are delineated on this slide. I don't have time to go through each and every one of them with you, but there are some that stand out. Some as breakthroughs, such as the initial identification of the virus by Francois Beres, you see, and our colleagues at the Pasteur. The demonstration that it's the etiological agent by Gallo and his colleagues. The intensive, incremental, if that was a breakthrough, the incremental science each year learning more and more about the HIV virus itself as well as the pathogenic mechanisms. Now, this is a confusing slide because I put on one slide about 30 years of incremental research. And what we know now a lot about this virus, the primary infection, the establishment of infection in lymphoid tissue, massive viremia, seeding of organs, immune activation, partial but never complete immunological control, accelerated virus replication, and in the absence of therapy, destruction of the immune system. Very important in that process of incremental scientific knowledge is understanding the early events in HIV, particularly at the mucosal surface, where there's vulnerability of the host and vulnerability of the virus. And understanding that interdigitation is extraordinarily important in insight into both transmission and vaccine development. Probably the most important of the accumulation of scientific advances is understanding the HIV replication cycle from the binding fusion, insertion of its, DNA, of its RNA, reverse transcription, integration, and then viral budding. Because each of that, year after year, has given us targets of vulnerability on the part of the virus. And it's that kind of basic science which brings us to the next step. And that is the step of interventions, predominantly in the arena of treatment and prevention. Let's start with treatment. I dug this slide out of my archives, a picture of me and some of our fellows and students in the very early 1980s, when we were frustrated clinically, but beginning to make headways scientifically. I refer to these as the dark years of my medical career. But what kept us, myself and my colleagues, not only here but throughout the country and the world going forward, even though we were much in the dark, was realizing what people were going through in the community, as eloquently stated by Cleve Jones in some of the films that you see about what was going on in the Castro in San Francisco, or by Larry Kramer in his play The Normal Heart, describing what was going on at Greenwich Village. But things began to happen. The science led to interventions. And if you look at the evolution of treatment strategies, the first drug in 1987, AZT, a glimmer of hope, virus goes down very little, doesn't stay down, resistance occurs. Years go by, two drugs, virus goes down further for a little bit longer, but not enough. Then the transforming meeting in Vancouver in 1996 where the three-drug therapy brings down the virus to below detectable level, stays there potentially indefinitely, and we have a new dawn of therapeutics with HIV AIDS that have transformed the lives of individuals. We have now up to 30 HIV, anti-HIV approved drugs by the FDA multiple classes used in combinations that have completely transformed things. But we can't stop there because there are still those who are not responding to these drugs and we still need long-acting drugs, particularly with regard to adherence.
The results have been spectacular. I'm going to pick out just a couple of examples. If you look, and this is a study from Holland, I told you back in the dark years of my experience, the median survival of my patients was six to eight months, 50% dead in six to eight months. Now, if a person walks into our clinic at the NIH or any other place that has availability of treatment, is young, 25, been recently infected, you put them on combination therapy and you could look them in the eye and tell them that it is likely, if they adhere to that regimen, that they will live an additional 50 years. This is not only confined. This is not confined just to the developed world because we know now in countries, for example, a cohort analysis in Uganda, that the same similar results with near normal life expectancy. That's the good news. But then there's challenges. This is a very scary slide because if you look in the United States of the 1.1 million people infected, 20% don't know they're infected, 62% are linked to care, 41% are retained in care, only 36% are on antivirals, and 28% are suppressing their viral loads. We must do better than that. We have the tool, and as I'll get to in a moment, we need to implement that. It can be all around. We can take examples from the developing world, but what we need to do is that we need, and are doing it, having a care continuum that is seeking out, testing, linking to care, treating when eligible, and making sure they adhere. And in fact, getting back to the District of Columbia, there is a study ongoing now with six cities, two of which are implement cities, the South Bronx and Washington, D.C., where we're starting to see that this can actually occur if you put the effort in, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that later from Wafa El Sadr and her colleagues. It doesn't only happen in the developed world, and that's what people keep saying. Is this going to really be able to be done? Well, take a look at what's going on in Rwanda, where when you have a community-based program, the two-year retention on treatment was 92%, with 98% tested at two years had suppressed viral load. Similar results in Botswana. Extending the intervention, what about prevention? Combination HIV prevention. The message for this is prevention is not unidimensional, and we all know that. There's a combination that's comprehensive. On the lower level of these building blocks are, are interventions that are not necessarily biologically driven. We were implementing them before we even knew there was a virus, what the virus was. But then as the years went by, science led us. Some examples, briefly, Prevention of mother-to-child transmission. The breakthrough study of 076 indicating that by treating the mother, you can actually decrease dramatically. Now, we treat mothers for their disease and then secondarily, together with the mother's health, the baby is born uninfected and can be breastfed. In the United States, this has transformed what you see now on these red bars, the estimated number of HIV-infected infants. But in fact, remember what Mayor Gray said last night. In this city, with high prevalence, there has not been a child born with HIV infected since 2009 in a city with high prevalence. That's the good news, that 600,000 pediatric uh, infections were averted by prophylaxis. But we still have a challenge. There are 330,000 new infections in 2011 alone. What about male circumcision? This is a stunningly successful intervention. The initial trials in South Africa, Kenya, and Uganda showed efficacy, that in the confines of a trial, it works. The real question is, will it work in the field? And as a matter of fact, uniquely, this is one of the few prevention interventions that actually gets better with time. Because the initial result was 55 to 60 percent. If you go to the Rakai district in Uganda, five years out, the effectiveness in the community is 73 percent. Topical microbicides, good news and challenging news because of mixed results. The Caprice study proved the concept. You can have a women-mandated uh, intervention by a gel 
that has tenofovir, when you adhere to it. This study and the PrEP study has then soberly told us something. Biological interventions work, but they don't work if you don't adhere, which tells us why we have to marry biological with behavioral. There's no doubt about that. What about the... the, the we know that from the voice study, which showed that in fact the study arm was discontinued due to fertility. Hopefully we'll get the answer from the fact study. Getting back to the long-acting orals, the same thing has to do with microbicides, and we're very pleased that the approach of now monthly use, and two studies were started this year, the Aspire study and the Ring study, which will hopefully bring a greater degree of adherence to show that efficacy can equal effectiveness. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, again, mixed results. The breakthrough study with the IPREX and the recent approval by the FDA of Truvada, both for high-risk men who have sex with men and heterosexual, either discordant couples or heterosexuals at risk. But there are some studies that show it doesn't work. It doesn't work almost certainly with some biological effect, perhaps with concentration of drug, but importantly, adherence, again, hammering home to us the concept that biological efficacy will not be effective without adherence. Probably the most game-changing advance over the last couple of years has been treatment as prevention with the now very famous HPTN052 trial, which reduced by 96% the likelihood that someone will transmit to their uninfected partner if you treat early a great argument for getting people on treatment. Now, before I go on to the implementation, I just want to mention that I'm telling you a lot of good news about science, but we still have challenges. We have challenges in the arena of vaccination. We have challenges in the reason of cure. What about the development of a vaccine? If we were able to plug in a vaccine block, we would surely have a very robust combination prevention package, even if it wasn't a perfect vaccine, even if it wasn't 90% or 80%, we could do it. Let's take a look at where we've been with that. You're all familiar with the RV144 trial. It's a humbling trial because it showed a modest degree of efficacy. But when you mine down and try and figure out the potential correlates, we find out that it's non-neutralizing, non-CD8-related, uh, response against a variable region of the envelope, something that the classic paradigm would not have predicted. But the neutralizing antibody approach is also very important, and in fact, naturally induced neutralizing antibody. As few as they are, as ineffective as they are, and as late as they are, are giving us scientific clues to identify neutralizing epitopes on the envelope which will do two things, and you're going to see parallel research going on. You're going to see structure-based immunogen design for a vaccine, at the same time, the provision passively of neutralizing antibodies, either by transfer or by gene-based vectors. We need to show if neutralizing antibodies actually do protect, otherwise a vaccine could be moot. What about a cure? Francoise and her colleagues a couple of days ago sponsored an extraordinary symposium about approaches to an HIV cure. Two general types, either eradication, purging it, which would be very difficult, or perhaps what I've called years ago a functional cure, namely either enhancing HIV-specific immunity or modifying the host cells to be resistant. I want to make sure that people, I know people in this room understand, but others don't. This is not an implementable intervention. This is way upstream on the fundamental basic discovery level so that you can put an end to the HIV pandemic, which as Mark said last night, is an epidemiological phenomenon without curing anybody. And you can cure a few people without putting an end to the HIV pandemic. So this is a scientific challenge. Let's go on to implementation. We've been able to implement, from what we've discussed over the last day or so, the extraordinary effect 
of the PEPFAR program, the Global Fund Philanthropies, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Médecins Sans Frontières, the Clinton Foundation, but importantly, recently, the assumption by host countries of their own responsibility, and this has really been very important. So I wanted to take a look at this, just a couple of minutes of this. What happens when you take an efficacious clinical trial-based scientific observation and you try to scale it up regionally or locally to see if it becomes effective? There are many examples. I'm just going to give you a few. What about the positive impact of scaling up antiretrovirals in Botswana? Take a look at the red dots, which is the percentage of mothers who are actually being treated. Take a look at the diminishing blue bars, the number and percentage of, of children who are born of HIV. It works. What about the fact that if you treat people, do you really save their lives? We now have 8 million people receiving antiretrovirals in low and middle income countries, which in fact, 840,000 age related deaths have been averted in 2011 alone. Ask the question, what about the positive impact of therapy on the, on, on the, on the HIV incidence? You go to a place where you have 30% coverage in KwaZulu-Natal and another section where there's 10% coverage. There's a 38% lower risk of acquiring HIV in those high coverage areas. Treatment as prevention works in the field if you implement it. We know that scientifically. What, a, what about the impact of voluntary male circumcision? Again, if you look at a study in the Rakhai district, if you take non-Muslim populations who generally don't get circumcised, and you increase the circumcision up to 35% by 2011, you have a 42% decrease in acquisition of infection. What about comorbidities? Art and TB, a very nefarious marriage between those two diseases. But look what art is doing for TB. It reduces incidence. The best way to prevent TB is by treating the HIV. It decreases it by 67%. It halves the recurrent rate and it reduces mortality by up to 90 plus percent. Now you're gonna hear a lot of models over the next few days, important models, Models can be complex and confusing depending upon what the assumptions are. You could model scale up of art, microbicides, PMCC, male circumcision, and even stick a vaccine in there. Rather than go through the complexities of the models, I want to talk to you just for a minute about a very uncomplicated aspirational model. We know now that the incidence is going down from 2.7 to 2.5. So the slope is going down. Notice in the lower right, I don't have a date there, because we can't talk about a date. But for sure, the decline is not steep enough. So when you talk about scaling up the things that Eric Goosby and others have been talking about, this is what we hope for, that we will see a major deflection of that curve. And if we're fortunate enough to add a vaccine to that, this is what we hope to see. No promises, no dates, but we know it can happen. So if you go back to what I've been saying about the science, today in July of 2012, the, the statement that we don't have the scientific basis to implement is no longer valid. We do. That's the point. The critical question is, what's going to happen because this will not happen spontaneously what it will require are the things that secretary clinton spoke about when she introduced the possibility in november of 2011 at the nih of an aids free generation a lot of people a lot of countries a lot of regions have a lot to do from country ownership capacity building health system strengthening increased commitment by current partners involving new partners coordination get rid of what does not work concentrate on what does work and remove the legal political and stigma barriers only then only then will this occur so let's get back to this dreaded map 
I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that I have had the opportunity to present at every one of the 19 meetings. This is the map that I let off this meeting for. What I hope for over the coming meetings of the International Aid Society is be able to start to show a map that goes like this, and this, and this, until finally we can say that we are the generation that opened the door through our scientific endeavors and our implementation to an AIDS-free generation. Thank you. Introducing our second speaker, please welcome Ebony Johnson, CEO of A Drop of Prevention and member of the Athena Network. Good morning. First as a woman from the United States, I am so pleased to welcome you back and to thank and congratulate the exceptional, bold leadership of President Obama for lifting a travel ban. But as a black woman residing in Washington, D.C., where we face the highest rates of HIV and where black women are the, at the center of vulnerability, it is a pleasure to welcome you back to be a voice and for this to be a call of action. It's my pleasure to introduce from the U.S. Phil Wilson. Phil Wilson is the president and CEO of the Black AIDS Institute. The Black AIDS Institute is the only national HIV AIDS think tank in the United States focused exclusively on ending the AIDS pandemic in black communities by engaging and mobilizing black institutions and individuals in efforts to confront HIV, by interpreting public and private sector policies, conducting trainings, providing technical assistance, and disseminating HIV and AIDS related information and advocacy from a uniquely and unapologetically black perspective. Wilson previously served as the AIDS coordinator for the city of Los Angeles, as the Director of Policy and Planning for Project Los Angeles, as co-chair of the Los Angeles Health Commission, and as an appointee to HRSA for the advisory committee. Wilson has been involved in a myriad of agencies from their inception across the United States. They include the National Black, Lesbian, and Gay Leadership Forum, the National Task Force on AIDS, the Chris Browley Hospice, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, the National Minority AIDS Council, the Los Angeles County Gay Men of Color Consortium, the K-Air Coalition, and Mr. Wilson has also worked very extensively across Eastern and Western Europe, in Sub-Saharan Africa, India, and Mexico. In 2001, Phil Wilson was named as the Leadership for Change in the World recipient. In 2004, he received the Discovery Health Channel Medical Honor. He has also been named as the 2005 Black History Makers in the Making by Black Entertainment Television. Mr. Wilson is a prolific writer who has published several articles and newspaper writings. Please welcome him to the stage. Thank you. both honored and humbled to have been asked by the conference organizers to share my thoughts with you this morning. But I'm also a little intimidated to have to follow Dr. Tony Fauci, one of the greatest heroes in this movement. 
And I'm more than a little nervous uh, to stand between you and one of the highlights of this conference, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. I'm thinking something about a rock and a hard place right now. But on behalf of the estimated 1.1 million Americans living with HIV and the tens of thousands of doctors, nurses, researchers, advocates, counselors, activists, and volunteers who serve them and work every day to end the AIDS epidemic in this country, welcome back to our house. Twenty-two years is a long time, and we missed you. And welcome to the first International AIDS Conference, where we know that we can end AIDS. Thirty-one years after this disease was discovered right here in this country, we finally have the right combination of tools and knowledge to stop the epidemic. No, we don't have a cure or a vaccine yet, but David only had a slingshot and he failed Goliath. Our tools are not perfect, but they are good enough to get the job done if, and this is a big if, if we use them efficiently, effectively, expeditiously, and compassionately. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I'm an openly gay man who has been living with HIV for 32 years. Treatment may be prevention, but I'm proof that treatment is treatment. When half of the people living with HIV in this country are black and over 60% are men who have sex with men, I understand why the organizers of this meeting would invite someone like me to give this talk. You see, I'm a threefer. I'm black, I'm gay, I'm HIV positive, and according, to, and according to AARP, I can clip off the senior box as well. <laughs> but it is not lost on me all the things that I am not. I am not a woman, a straight man, or a transgendered person. I am not an Asian Pacific Islander. Latino, Native American, white, or an immigrant. I don't speak Spanish, Creole, or Vietnamese. I'm not an injecting drug user, sex worker, homeless, or the victim of domestic violence. I don't live in the rural South, and I've never even been to Anchorage or Bismarck. But I know this. I know that we will not end the AIDS epidemic in this country unless all of those voices are included. All of what I am and am not must be a part of the conversation. The United States spans nine time zones. It has a population of over 300 million people speaking 311 languages. In 14 million American households, English is not the primary language. You might think that the United States has it easy, and in some ways we do. We have great universities that generate superb science. We have an entrepreneurial and a can-do spirit, and we're wealthy. But even so, many of our residents live in debilitating poverty. We have unacceptable levels of homelessness, addiction, and mental health illness. We have large numbers of people with HIV who suffer from other diseases, such as hepatitis B and C, and are marginalized and stigmatized. We not only have the largest epidemic in the developed world, we have one of the most complicated epidemics in the entire world. We face gigantic challenges, challenges that demand we rely on lessons learned in many other countries, lessons learned by you in this room, and challenges that offer the possibility for learning lessons that, in turn, can be applied all over the globe. Approximately 50,000 people get infected each year in the United States. That's a dramatic decrease from where we were in the mid-80s. But our prevention efforts have been stalled for at least the last 15 years. Demographically, our epidemic is 75% male and 25% female. 
Estimated HIV prevalence among transgender persons ranged from 14% to 69%. Our epidemic is 43% black, 34% white, 19% Latino, 1% Asian Pacific Islander, and less 1% Native American and Hawaiian. 44% of the epidemic lives in 12 cities, but new HIV infections are rapidly rising in rural communities, especially the South. The U.S. epidemic is primarily a concentrated epidemic, but in certain populations, we have generalized epidemics. For example, with a background HIV prevalence of almost 3%, and 835 new HIV infections in 2010, the AIDS epidemic in Washington, D.C. right here is a generalized one. And it is one that is worse than the AIDS epidemic in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Black men who have sex with men are engulfed in a raging generalized epidemic. According to a new report released by the National Black Gay Men's Advocacy Coalition, the Black Gay Research Group, and the Black AIDS Institute, Black MSM are at an elevated risk for HIV infection regardless of age. The odds that a black MSM will become infected increases from one and four, one and four at age 25 to 59.3% chance by the time he reaches 40 years old. Now, now think about that for a minute. By the time a black gay man reaches 40 years old, nearly 60% of them, six out of 10, will be HIV positive. The AIDS epidemic in America is a tale of two cities. That seems to be a theme this week. It is definitely the best of times and the worst of times. We have a system that can work very well for some of us, but for many of us, the system is terribly, terribly broken. The other day, I was talking to my friend David Munar, the president and CEO of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, about his friend Luis, a Mexican immigrant who lived the last nine years of his life in the United States. He worked six and sometimes seven days a week as a busboy and dishwasher at two restaurants. He paid taxes and otherwise obeyed the law. He was privately jovial, silly, and loved to dress in drag don't we all? <laughs> His health declined rapidly, and tragically, in 1995, at the age of 25, Luis died from age-related complications. His friends pulled together the resources to bury him. But what followed next shocked everyone who knew him. His name was not Luis. That was an alias he assumed for work papers. Social Security and Medicaid. He lived the most secretive life of all. In fact, his sister, who traveled from Mexico to co collect his remains, learned only after his death that her brother was gay and had AIDS. Luis's deception helped him access meds and health care that he otherwise could not afford, but it denied him a chance to live and die with dignity. Lauren Starworth uh, is in the audience today. He was 17 years old when he found out that he was HIV positive. It only took one mistake for the virus to become a personal reality for him. Lawrence's father, once he found out that his son had HIV, reacted by going into the bathroom and closing the door. Lawrence eventually got linked to care and found a job working in HIV. Unfortunately, his job didn't offer health insurance and did not pay enough for Lawrence to pay for his own treatment. So he was forced to choose between working or staying on medication. What kind of choice is that? Luis and Lawrence are not isolated examples. This next model, first described by Dr. Edward Garno at the University of Colorado, estimates how many people with HIV in the U.S. are engaged in the various steps in the continuum of care from diagnosis to viral suppression. There are three things in this slide that strike me most. First, about 80% of HIV positive people in the United States know their status. Now, we can do better, but that's not too bad. Second, 
once we get people on antiretrovirals, around 71% get to suppression. Again, we can do better. But the real problem is in this middle section here. We do a terrible job of moving people from testing to being on antiretrovirals. Between testing positive and going on antiretrovirals, we lose 54% of people with HIV. Remember, these are people for whom we have some kind of contact. Bottom line, in the richest nation on the planet, barely a quarter of the people with HIV are in fully effective treatment. More than 70% are either not on treatment at all or on suboptimal treatment. That's bad for them, and it's bad for everyone else. Because when they are not on treatment, they are much, much more likely to spread the virus. We, you and I, the people in this room, the people in the global village, the people doing work back at home every day who couldn't afford to come to this conference, have to change that. Luckily, there are people and programs that are showing us how. Right here in this city, the Community Education Group, a small not-for-profit organization that serves predominantly black neighborhoods, offers HIV tests and a whole lot more. Of the people CEG tests who turn out to be positive, 95%, 95% are linked, relinked, or confirmed to be receiving HIV care and treatment services. Rather than giving individuals a paper referral, CEG provides its clients an immediate personal escort, and if needed, financial incentives to go to medical providers. CEG uses new technology to conduct risk assessments and enroll community members in DC's free insurance program and or Medicaid. They also provide patient follow-up, such as text message reminders and indications of when they have medical appointments. Something else happened here in Washington, D.C. There's a huge help for people with HIV. It's called the Affordable Care Act, better known as Obamacare. Because of this law, no insurance company can, can deny you coverage because you have a pre-existing condition, jack up your rates, or drop you because you get sick, or because your care costs too much. For people with HIV and AIDS, these provisions are absolutely life-saving. Leadership matters. Two years ago, President Obama released the first ever comprehensive HIV AIDS strategy in the United States. According to the vision of the strategy, the United States would become a place where new HIV infections are rare. And when they do occur, every person, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, or social economic circumstance, will have unfettered access to high quality, life extending care, free from stigma and discrimination. Together, we can manifest that vision if we do the following things. First, we must fully implement the Affordability Care Act. This will deliver health coverage to more than 30 million people who are currently uninsured. Single, childless adults who typically not eligible for Medicaid a critical failure in an epidemic concentrated among low-income gay men. But under the Affordable Care Act, everyone will have a means to pay for life-saving treatment. This most important piece of legislation over the last 40 years has generated a lot of opposition and misinformation. AIDS advocates must be at the forefront of opposing any efforts any efforts to roll back reform on the, aid, on the Affordability Care Act. We need to ensure that the mandatory benefits packages under the legislation include an annual physical for everyone, 
an HIV test at every physical, including at least two annual HIV tests for high-risk individuals, twice a year viral load tests for people living with HIV, and comprehensive coverage of ARVs, ARVs, both for treatment and prevention. Second, everyone living with, living with HIV must come out. We all must come out. Living openly and proudly with HIV not only confronts HIV stigma, but it also helps build demand for essential services. Openly HIV positive people serve as living, compelling reminders of the importance of knowing one's HIV status. And that is, that, and that it also communicates that it's possible to live a full, healthy life with HIV, and that's important. When you come out about your HIV status, you not only save your life, but you save other lives as well. My family is here in this room this morning. My brother, my, mom, my dad, and my mom. When I was 24, I gave my mother a book called Loving Someone Gay. And she said to me, why do you give me this book? I don't love anyone gay. Yes, you do, I said. You love me. And I was right. I'm alive today because I have the love and support of family and friends. But, I could, but they could not support me if I denied them a chance to truly know me. Not just some one-dimensional avatar of me, but all of me. Despite the quilt being on the mall this week, which is really about our death, the story of our lives go largely untold and unnoticed. We want our families to love us and to support us, but they cannot love us if they don't know us, and they can't know us if we continue to hide from them. Now, I'm not naive. I know it's too dangerous for some of us to come out right now, but some of us can, and if we do, others will be able to join us later. Third, we need to put as much emphasis on building demand for treatment as we do on ensuring access. Our healthcare system has long been a source of shame. The United States is the only industrialized country that has not guaranteed health coverage for its citizens. But through a combination of programs, such as Medicaid and the Ryan White Care Act, we've actually built a robust system of care for people living with HIV. Yet only about one in four people with HIV in our country are now receiving the care they need and deserve. If we demand it, they will have to build it. Health services aren't meaningful unless they're actually used. Too many people are intimidated by the medical system. Too many still believe that a positive HIV test is a death sentence. And too many people believe that HIV treatment requires a fistful of pills every day with horrible side effects. We need a massive investment in community education and HIV science treatment literacy. We need an army of peer patient navigators that link individuals to the care they need. Four, we need to integrate the biomedical and the behavioral in our prevention and treatment efforts. Some people in the AIDS field continue to resist the so-called medicalization of AIDS, while others promote these new bi biomedical tools as a panacea. Neither perspective is correct. These new biomedical strategies, the treatment as prevention, PrEP, and the others still to be developed, are more powerful than anything we've ever had in our toolkit before. But to work, these powerful biomedical tools will need to connect with actual people, those who deliver them and those who use them. Our biomedical interventions won't be effective if people are frustrated by the complexity of our medical delivery service system, and they simply give up. If they don't understand the importance of adhering to the prescribed regimens, 
or if, or if their providers are judgmental or display that they don't understand what our lives are like. Over the course of this epidemic, we've learned a lot about how to influence human behavior. And we need to apply these les lessons as we put our new biomedical tools into practice. The crucial point here is that it is not an either or, but a both and and. The biomedical model only works when education, counseling, behavioral change, adherence, and support are all there. The whole history of the epidemic has shown us that while education and social and behavior interventions are necessary, they are absolutely not sufficient. If they were, the epidemic would be over already. It's the addition of biomedical interventions that can lead us to the promise of ending AIDS. We must turn this tide together. Finally, the fifth thing we need to do is that AIDS organizations need to retool themselves to, to a rapidly revolving AIDS landscape. Communities will always remain central to our ability to end AIDS. But most, most of our community-based organizations have focused their expertise on behavioral interventions only. Few have meaningful scientific expertise, and fewer still actually deliver health care services. With biomedical tools rapidly becoming a critical part of our AIDS response, and with the Affordable Care Act poised to dramatically alter the terrain for health and social services, many AIDS organizations risk becoming wholly irrelevant. Fortunately, some visionary organizations have already begun to retool. Harlem United, for example, has actively worked to adapt to the dynamic environment, readying itself for state Medicaid reform and shifts in the nation's healthcare system. It began as a small organization, but today it is a federally qualified health center with 3,000 patients. Harlem United connects the dot between medical care and social services. Eric De La Torre is also here this morning. He's a health educator and youth advocate for Vienna Star, a unique peer-based social service organization serving Latinos in Los Angeles. They serve them by building an infrastructure that connects prevention and treatment and science with advocacy. Harlem United, CEG, and Vienna Star are three examples of what effective AIDS service organizations must look like if we're going to end the AIDS epidemic. I have a reoccurring dream in which a little boy asks a wise old woman, what did you do when millions of people were dying from AIDS? I always wake up before the wise old woman has a chance to answer. I'm afraid I wake up because I'm afraid of the answer. I'm afraid the answer will be not enough. I work for a tiny organization, and for all I know, we may close our doors next week. But this week, this week, with our 30 black treatment advocates and our black scientists, now this week with our journalists, we are going to squeeze every drop of information out of this meeting we can. My worst nightmare is that we will squander this historic opportunity. And this is what I know. The day will come when this epidemic will be over. And when it does, it's important for them to know that we were not all monsters, that we were not all cowards, that some of us, some of us dared to care in the face of it. Some of us, some of us dared to fight because of it. And some of us, some of us dare to love in spite of it, because it is in the caring and the fighting and the loving that we live forever. This is our time. This is our deciding moment. Together, we are greater than AIDS.
Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker will be on shortly. Please stand by. Please welcome Michelle Sidibe, Executive Director of UNAIDS. Friends, when we got her at the opening ceremony, I challenge you all to dream big dreams, to be bold, to think of opportunity we have to end this epidemic. To be able to say 10 or 20 years from now that our generation took us over the finish line. Our generation made the decision to finally end AIDS. What a legacy for all of us. This morning, I am humbled to be given the honor to introduce a great leader who already is turning our aspiration into reality. She is part of America's dream team for HIV. <laughs> President Obama, Secretary Clinton, Secretary Sebelius, and my brother and friend, Ambassador Gooseby. 
Secretary Clinton is a person of vision, courage, and intellect. Around the world, her leadership has touched so many people, from people in island communities to heads of state. She was the first global leader to use foreign policy as a tool to promote global health. For example, appointing America's first ambassador at large for global women's issues. She was the first global leader to speak out about the tragic physical and economic impact of violence against women. And last November, she was the first global leader to call for an eighth free generation. She challenged us all to imagine a world where all babies are born free from HIV, where everyone in need has access to treatment, where the rights of women and girls are protected and promoted. Where shared responsibility is met with a global solidarity and where all people, but especially those most affected by the epidemic, have no fear or stigma or discrimination. She understands that if we turn the tide against HIV now, it will produce benefits across health and development around the world. History will remember her not only as one of the world's most inspiring leaders, but also as one of its most effective and committed visionaries for change. At a moment when uh, she has uh, so many urgent demands from uh, Syria to Afghanistan to the Human Rights Council, her presence here is a powerful testimony of her heart and sincerity. And despite her global commitments, she has always found time to be a caring mother of her impressive daughter. It is my tremendous pleasure and honor to introduce a true champion of the AIDS movement, the Secretary of State of United States of America, Hillary Rodham Clinton. too long. 
Welcome to the United States. We are so pleased to have you all finally back here. And I want to thank the leaders of the many countries who have joined us. I want to acknowledge my colleagues from the administration and the Congress who have contributed so much to the fight against AIDS. But mostly, I want to salute all of the people who are here today who do the hard work that has given us the chance to stand here in 2012 and actually imagine a time when we will no longer be afflicted by this terrible epidemic and the great cost and suffering it has imposed for far too long. On behalf of all Americans, we thank you. But I want to take a step back and think how far we have come since the last time this conference was held in the United States. It was in 1990 in San Francisco. Dr. Eric Goosby, who's now our global AIDS ambassador, ran a triage center there for all the HIV positive people who became sick during the conference. They set up IV drop, drug drips to rehydrate patients. They gave antibiotics to people with AIDS-related pneumonia. Many had to be hospital hospitalized, and a few died. Even at a time when the world's response to the epidemic was sorely lacking, there were places and people of caring where people with AIDS found support. But tragically, there was so little that could be done medically. And thankfully, that has changed. Caring brought action, and action has made an impact. The ability to prevent and treat the disease has advanced beyond what many might have reasonably hoped 22 years ago. Yes, AIDS is still incurable, but it no longer has to be a death sentence. That is a tribute to the work of countless people around the world, many of whom are here at this conference, others who are no longer with us but whose contributions live on. And for decades, the United States has played a key role. Starting in the 1990s, under the Clinton administration, we began slowly to make HIV treatment drugs more affordable. We began to face the epidemic in our own country. And then in 2003, President Bush launched PEPFAR with strong bipartisan support from Congress, and this country began treating millions of people. Today, under President Obama, we are building on this legacy. PEPFAR is shifting out of emergency mode and starting to build sustainable health systems that will help us finally win this fight and deliver an AIDS-free generation. It's hard to overstate how sweeping or how crucial this change is. When President Obama took office, we knew that if we were going to win the fight against AIDS, we could not keep treating it as an emergency. We had to fundamentally change the, we, the way we and our global partners did business. So we've engaged diplomatically with ministers of finance and health, but also with presidents and prime ministers to listen and learn about their priorities and needs in order to chart the best way forward together. 
Now, I will admit that has required difficult conversations about issues that some leaders don't want to face, like government corruption in the procurement and delivery of drugs, or dealing with injecting drug users. But it has been an essential part of helping more countries manage more of their own response to the epidemic. We've also focused on supporting high-impact interventions, making tough decisions driven by science about what we will and will not fund, and we are delivering more results for the American taxpayer's dollar by taking simple steps, switching to generic drugs, which saved more than $380 million in 2010 alone. And crucially, we have vastly improved our coordination with the Global Fund. Where we used to work independently of each other, we now sit down together to decide, for example, which of us will fund AIDS treatment somewhere and which of us will fund the delivery of that treatment. That is a new way of working together for both of us, but I think it holds great results for all of us. Now, all of these strategic shifts have required a lot of heavy lifting. But it only matters, in the end, if it means we are saving more lives. And we are. Since 2009, we have more than doubled the number of people who get treatment that keeps them alive. We are also reaching far more people with prevention, testing, and counseling. And I want publicly to thank, first and foremost, Dr. Eric Goosby, who has been on the front lines of all this work since the 1980s in San Francisco. He is somewhere in this vast hall, cringing with embarrassment, but more than anyone else, he had a vision for what PEPFAR needed to become and the tenacity to keep working to make it happen. And I want to thank his extraordinary partners here in this administration, Dr. Tom Frieden at the Centers for Disease Control and Dr. Raj Shah at USAID. Now, with the progress we are making together, we can look ahead to a historic goal, creating an AIDS-free generation. This is part of President Obama's call to make fighting global HIV AIDS at home and abroad a priority for this administration. In July 2010, he launched the first comprehensive national HIV AIDS strategy, which has reinvigorated the domestic response to the epidemic, especially important here in Washington, D.C., which needs more attention, more resources, and smarter strategies to deal with the epidemic in our nation's capital. And last November, at the National Institutes of Health, with my friend Dr. Tony Fauci there, I spoke in depth about the goal of an AIDS-free generation and laid out some of the ways we are advancing it through PEPFAR, USAID, and the CDC. And on World AIDS Day, President Obama announced an ambitious commitment for the United States to reach six million people globally with life-saving treatment. Now, since that time, I've heard a few voices from people raising questions about America's commitment to an AIDS-free generation, wondering whether we are really serious about achieving it. Well, I am here today to make it absolutely clear. 
the United States is committed and will remain committed to achieving an AIDS-free generation. We will not back off. We will not back down. We will fight for the resources necessary to achieve this historic milestone. I know that many of you share my passion about achieving this goal. In fact, one could say I am preaching to the choir. But right now, I think we need a little preaching to the choir. And we need the choir and the congregation to keep singing, lifting up their voices and spreading the message to everyone who is still standing outside. So while I want to reaffirm my government's commitment, I'm also here to boost yours. This is a fight we can win. We have already come so far, too far to stop now. I want to describe some of the progress we've made toward that goal and some of the work that lies ahead. Let me begin by defining what we mean by an AIDS-free generation. It is a time when, first of all, virtually no child anywhere will be born with the virus. <laughs> Secondly, as children and teenagers become adults, they will be at significantly lower risk of ever becoming infected than they would be today, no matter where they are living. And third, if someone does acquire HIV, they will have access to treatment that helps prevent them from developing AIDS and passing the virus on to others. So yes, HIV may be with us into the future until we finally achieve a cure a vaccine, but the disease that HIV causes need not be with us. As of last fall, every agency in the United States government involved in this effort is working together to get us on that path to an AIDS-free generation. We're focusing on what we call combination prevention. Our strategy includes condoms, counseling and testing, and places special emphasis on three other interventions. Treatment as prevention, voluntary medical male circumcision, and stopping the transmission of HIV from mothers to children. Since November, we have elevated combination prevention in all our HIV AIDS work, including right here in Washington, which still has the highest HIV rate of any large city in our country. And globally, we have supported our partner countries shifting their investments toward the specific mix of prevention tools that will have the greatest impact for their people. For example, Haiti is scaling up its efforts to prevent mother-to-child transmission, including full treatment for mothers with HIV, which will in turn, of course, prevent new infections. And for the first time, the Haitian Ministry of Health is committing its own funding to provide antiretroviral treatment. We're also making notable progress on the three pillars of our combination prevention strategy. On treatment as prevention, the United States has added funding for nearly 600,000 more people since September, which means we are reaching nearly four and a half million people now and closing in on our national goal of six million by the end of next year. That is our contribution to the global effort to reach universal coverage. 
On male circumcision, we've supported more than 400,000 procedures since last December alone. And I'm pleased to announce that PEPFAR will provide an additional $40 million to support South Africa's plans to provide voluntary medical circumcisions for almost a half a million of boys and men in the coming year. You know and we want the world to know that this procedure reduces the risk of female to male transmission by more than 60 percent and for the rest of the man's life. So the impact can be phenomenal. In Kenya and Tanzania, mothers ask for circumcision campaigns during school vacations so their teenage sons could participate. In Zimbabwe, some male lawmakers wanted to show their constituents how safe and virtually painless the procedure is, so they went to a mobile clinic and got circumcised. That's the kind of leadership we welcome. And we are also seeing the development of new tools that would allow people to perform the procedure with less training and equipment than they need today without compromising safety. And when such a device is approved by the World Health Organization, PEPFAR is ready to support it right away. And on mother-to-child transmission, we are committed to eliminating it by 2015, getting the number to zero. Over the years, We've invested more than $1 billion for this effort. In the first half of this fiscal year, we reached more than 370,000 women globally, and we are on track to hit PEPFAR's target of reaching an additional 1.5 million women by next year. We are also setting out to overcome one of the biggest hurdles in getting to zero. When women are identified as HIV positive and eligible for treatment, they are often referred to another clinic, one that may be too far away for them to reach. As a result, too many women never start treatment. Today, I am announcing that the United States will invest an additional $80 million to fill this gap. These funds... These funds will support innovative approaches to ensure that HIV-positive pregnant women get the treatment they need to protect themselves, their babies, and their partners. So let there be no mistake. The United States is accelerating its work on all three of these fronts in the effort to create an AIDS-free generation. And look at how all these elements come together to make a historic impact. In Zambia, we're supporting the government as they step up their efforts to prevent mother-to-child transmission. Between 2009 and 2011, the number of new infections went down by more than half. And we are just getting started. Together, we're going to keep up our momentum on mother-to-child transmission. In addition, we will help many more Zambians get on treatment and support a massive scale-up of male circumcision as well. Two steps that, according to our models, will drive down the number of new sexually transmitted infections there by more than 25% over the next five years. So as the number of new infections in Zambia goes down, it will be possible to treat more people than are becoming infected each year. So we will, for the first time, get ahead of the pandemic there. And eventually, an AIDS-free generation of Zambians will be in sight. Think of the lives we will touch in Zambia alone, all the mothers and fathers and children who will never have their lives ripped apart by this disease. 
and now multiply that across the many other countries we are working with. In fact, if you're not getting excited about this, please raise your hand and I will send somebody to check your pulse. <laughs> But I know, I know that creating an AIDS-free generation takes more than the right tools, as important as they are. Ultimately, it's about people. The people who have the most to contribute to this goal and the most to gain from it. That means embracing the essential role that communities play, especially people living with HIV and the critical work of faith-based organizations. We need to make sure we're looking out for orphans and vulnerable children who are too often still overlooked in this epi epidemic. And it will be no surprise to you to hear me say I want to highlight the particular role that women play. In sub-Saharan Africa today, women account for 60% of those living with HIV. Women want to protect themselves from HIV and they want access to adequate health care. And we need to answer their call. PEPFAR is part of our comprehensive effort to meet the health needs of women and girls working across the United States government and with our partners on HIV, maternal and child health, and reproductive health, including voluntary family planning and our newly launched child survival call to action. Every woman should be able to decide when and whether to have children. This is true whether she is HIV positive or not. with the strong message that came out of the London Summit on Family Planning earlier this month. There should be no controversy about this, none at all. And across all of our health and development work, the United States is emphasizing gender equality because women need and deserve a voice in the decisions that affect their lives. to prevent and respond to gender-based violence, which puts women at higher risk for contracting the virus, and because women need more ways to protect themselves from HIV infection. Last year, we invested more than $90 million in research on microbicide, microbicides. All these efforts will help close the health gap between women and men and lead to healthier families, communities, and nations as well. If we're going to create an AIDS-free generation, we also must address the needs of the people who are at the highest risk of contracting HIV. One recent study of female sex workers and those trafficked into prostitution in low- and middle-income countries found that, on average, 12% of them were HIV positive, far above the rates for women at large. And people who use injecting drugs account for about one-third of all the people who acquire HIV outside of sub-Saharan Africa. And in low- and middle-income countries, studies suggest that HIV prevalence among men who have sex with male partners could be up to 19 times higher than among the general population. Now, over the years, I have seen and experienced how difficult it can be to talk about a disease that is transmitted the way that AIDS is. But 
If we're going to beat AIDS, we can't afford to avoid sensitive conversations, and we can't fail to reach the people who are at the highest risk. Unfortunately, today, very few countries monitor the quality of services delivered to these high-risk key populations. Fewer still rigorously assess whether the services provided actually prevent transmission or do anything to ensure that HIV-positive people in these groups get the care and treatment they need. Even worse, some take actions that, rather than discouraging risky behavior, actually drives more people into the shadows where the epidemic is that much harder to fight. And the consequences are devastating for the people themselves and for the fight against HIV. Because when key groups are marginalized, the virus spreads rapidly within those groups and then also into the lower risk general population. We are seeing this happen right now in Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia. Humans might discriminate, but viruses do not. And there is an old saying that goes, why rob banks? Because that's where the money is. If we want to save more lives, we need to go where the virus is and get there as quickly as possible. And that means science should guide our efforts. So today I'm announcing three new efforts by the United States government to reach key populations. We will invest $15 million in implementation research to identify the specific interventions that are most effective for each key population. We are also launching a $20 million challenge fund that will support country-led plans to expand services for key populations. And finally, through the Robert Carr Civil Society Network Fund, we will invest $2 million to bolster the efforts of civil society groups to reach key populations. Now, Americans are rightly proud of the leading role that our country plays in the fight against HIV-AIDS. And the world has learned a great deal through PEPFAR about what works and why. And we've also learned a great deal about the needs that are not being met and how everyone can and must work together to meet those needs. For our part, PEPFAR will remain at the center of America's commitment to an AIDS-free generation. I have asked Ambassador Dr. Goosby to take the lead on developing and sharing our blueprint of the goals and objectives for the next phase of our effort and to release this blueprint by World AIDS Day this year. We want the next Congress, the next Secretary of State, and all of our partners here at home and around the world to have a clear picture of everything we've learned and a roadmap that shows what we will contribute to achieving an AIDS-free generation. Reaching this goal is a shared responsibility. It begins with what we can all do to help break the chain of mother-to-child transmission, and this takes leadership at every level, from investing in healthcare workers to removing the registration fees that discourage women from seeking care. And we need community and, fa and family leaders, from grandmothers to religious leaders, to encourage women to get tested and to demand treatment if they need it. We also have a shared responsibility to support multilateral institutions like the Global Fund. In recent months, as the United States has stepped up our commitment, so have Saudi Arabia, Japan, Germany, the Gates Foundation, and others. And I encourage other donors, especially in emerging economies, to increase their contributions to this essential organization. And then finally, 
We all have a shared responsibility to get serious about promoting country ownership, the end state where a nation's efforts are led, implemented, and eventually paid for by its government, its communities, its civil society, its private sector. I spoke earlier about how the United States is supporting country ownership, but well, we also look to our partner countries and donors to do their part. They can follow the example of the last few years in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, India, and other countries who are able to provide more and better care for their own people because they are committing more of their own resources to HIV AIDS. And partner countries also need to take steps like fighting corruption and making sure their systems for approving drugs are as efficient as possible. I began today by recalling the last time this conference was held here in the United States. And I want to close by recalling another symbol of our cause, the AIDS Memorial Quilt. For a quarter century, this quilt has been a source of solace and comfort for people around the world, a visible way to honor and remember, to mourn husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, partners and friends. Some of you have seen the parts of the quilt that are on view in Washington this week. I well remember the moment in 1996 when Bill and I went to the National Mall to see the quilt for ourselves. I had sent word ahead that I wanted to know where the names of friends I had lost were placed so that I could be sure to find them. When we saw how enormous the quilt was, covering acres of ground, stretching from the Capitol building to the Washington Monument. It was devastating. And in the months and years that followed, the quilt kept growing. In fact, back in 1996 was the last time it could be displayed all at once. It just got too big. Too many people kept dying. We are all here today because we want to bring about that moment when we stop adding names. When we can come to a gathering like this one and not talk about the fight against AIDS, but instead commemorate the birth of a generation that is free of AIDS. Now that moment is still in the distance, but we know what road we need to take we are closer to that destination than we've ever been. And as we continue on this journey together, we should be encouraged and inspired by the knowledge of how far we've already come. So today and throughout this week, let us restore our own faith and renew our own purpose so we may together reach that goal of an AIDS-free generation and truly honor all of those who have been lost. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated and stand by while we reset the stage for the next presenter.
Our next speaker will begin her speech shortly. Please welcome Dr. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization. Good morning, good morning, good morning to all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, the next presentation is titled Turning the Tide in Affected Countries, Leadership, Accountability and Targets. It is indeed my pleasure to introduce Sheila Cloud, who is the 